uh, beat surface. Um, one of the problems with the STD-NMR technique is that it is prone to false positives. Um, so if your small molecule aggregates for some reason, or if you're accidentally perturbing the ligand resonances with your um, off-resonance saturation, you may see an STD effect where you don't actually have binding. Um, so for this reason, uh, we like to do a control experiment where we take the same uh, ligand at the same concentration, but simply remove the polystyrene beads. Um, so isopropanol was also found to bind to these uh, carboxylate nanoparticles, uh, polystyrene beads. Um, so when we have the isopropanol in, in the beads, we see um, a positive STD effect um, for both uh, the CH3 and the CH resonances. Um, when we remove the beads, we see only uh, cancellation. Um, so this gives us uh, confidence that what we're seeing is actually saturation uh, in which we saturate the beads and we see saturation being transferred from the beads to isopropanol. Um, so this gives us confidence that what we're seeing is actually an STD effect. Um, now, going towards the idea of eventually using this technique to study uh, peptides and proteins interacting with the surface of nanoparticles, um, we began by screening uh, various amino acids for binding to, um, again, carboxylate modified uh, polystyrene beads. So these are polystyrene with negative charges um, on the surface. And um, this actually gave us a lot of insight into the different uh, possible reasons for binding. Um, so what we saw was that uh, for the positively charged amino acids like lysine, um, as expected, we saw um, small STD effects. Um, so the polystyrene beads are negatively charged, so we would expect that positively charged amino acids should have some uh, interaction. Um, but what we saw that was uh, maybe more interesting was we saw very large STD effects for um, aromatic amino acids. Um, and so this may indicate that, uh, you know, we've, we've never assumed that these beads are perfect spheres with negative charges on the uh, outside, um, but this kind of indicates the, really the porosity or the flexibility in the surface um, that these aromatic molecules might be able to interact with the styrene core um, through pi stacking. And this might give um, increased, uh, more, more strong binding um, and increased STD effects. <clears throat> um, so this is very interesting. Um, we sort of saw three main uh, situations for binding. One was that um, the positively charged amino acids would bind through electrostatic effects. Um, the aromatic amino acids would bind through uh, pi stacking. And then um, it's not shown here, but long chain aliphatic um, amino acids also had some binding through um, van der Waals interactions or hydrophobic effects. <clears throat> Um, so this is going into a little more detail. Um, one can create an STD buildup curve um, by increasing the saturation time, so just doing experiments at different saturation times. Um, and then we would expect the STD effect to build up and then um, level off. And in this case, the STD effect is defined as um, the integral of the uh, peak in the STD difference spectrum divided by the peak in the reference spectrum. Um, and again, for the aromatic amino acids, we saw, number one, that these had the greatest um, STD effects, um, so the highest uh, buildup curves. <clears throat> and then also what we saw was that um, the largest STD effects, even among these um, um, aromatic amino acids, were actually in the aromatic region. Um, so uh, on the right here, these blue numbers are um, looking at the initial slope of the STD buildup curve. Um, so it's been shown that the initial slope of the buildup curve could be a better measure um, of relative binding uh, rather than looking at, say, the maximum STD effect or the STD effect at one particular saturation time. Um, so the uh, blue numbers are the percent of the initial slope. So the highest proton with the highest initial slope has a uh, 100, um, and then uh, other blue numbers are relative uh, initial slopes. So we see that in each case, the highest initial slope, the 100%, is always um, in the aromatic ring. Um, and the percentage, relative percentage of the initial slope drops off as we get to the um, alpha and beta protons. So looking at those three different kinds of binding, um, my uh, current graduate student, Hui, um, who has been an excellent graduate student and is actually planning to graduate in May um, and is looking for a postdoc position, um, so if you're interested in talking to her about her work, um, she will be at poster 30 uh, this afternoon. Um, so definitely check out um, her work and talk to her if you're interested. 
um, she has done excellent work in the group. Um, she decided that um, looking at the different modes of binding for the different amino acids um, binding to these polystyrene nanoparticles, uh, she would explore these in more detail and sort of validate these hypotheses by examining binding to uh, zwitterionic polystyrene beads. Um, so these beads have uh, carboxylate groups and amine groups at the surface, um, and that makes them um, positively charged at low pH um, and negatively charged at uh, neutral and high pH. Um, so this allowed her, by varying the pH, to look at situations where you might have um, bead surfaces and amino, uh, amino acids with the same charge, um, with opposite charge, or one neutral and one um, charge. And uh, what she saw was that um, for at all pH, um, the aromatic amino acids had the highest um, initial slope of the STD buildup curve. Um, so no matter what the pH, um, these aromatic amino acids won out. Uh, the next set of amino acids that had some measurable STD effect um, were positively charged amino acids, so histidine, arginine, and lysine. Um, these, as you can see, um, at low pH, where the beads are positive and the aromatic, I mean, or, and the amino acids are also positive, there is no measurable STD effect. Um, but once you get to neutral um, and high pH, you see an STD effect for these amino acids. Um, so looking at these in more detail, um, at pH 6 and high pH, pH 9 and 10, um, those, uh, the beads are negatively charged um, in both cases. And at neutral pH, um, the, aromatic, the amino acids are also going to be positively charged. Um, and so the interaction uh, drops off when you go to higher pH uh, because uh, at this pH, um, the beads become negatively charged and the amino acids are also negatively charged. So as expected, um, when you go from positive to negative to negative to negative, um, you have a decrease in the binding. Um, and I will let Hui talk um, a little more about that. Uh, she also did studies um, looking at increasing the salt concentration um, to examine electrostatic effects in more detail, um, and also a structure activity relationship to look at um, the van der Waals interactions or hydrophobic effect by varying the length um, of the side chain of these amino acids. Um, so if you're interested in more details in those experiments, um, please visit Hui's poster uh, this afternoon. Um, so for the last few minutes, I'll talk about um, a new project in our group, looking at um, another reason why we might be interested in studying small molecules interacting with uh, the surface of plastic nanoparticles. Um, and this is regarding plastic pollution. So there's a lot of plastic in our oceans, rivers, um, other waterways. Um, and this is only increasing with the coronavirus pandemic. So we have um, increasing use of uh, plastic silverware for takeout and plastic containers, um, closing of recycling facilities, uh, improper disposal of gloves and other PPE, um, pulling back on bans of single-use plastic bags. Um, so the idea of plastic pollution is going to be something that we're going to deal with from uh, the pandemic long after it's over. And what happens when the plastic is um, in the uh, water and ocean over time, um, it's going to get broken down into micro and nano uh, scale particles. And um, these particles can be eaten by fish um, and then move up the food chain to larger fish and even um, fish that could be intended for human consumption. So we may be consuming these plastic particles uh, that are in the ocean. And one of the problems, in addition to, uh, we don't know what happens when you ingest a lot of plastic, um, but these plastic particles can also um, concentrate uh, small molecule pollutants from the ocean. So they can concentrate um, carcinogens like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, they can be sources of endocrine disru disruptors like bisphenol A. Um, so what we want to do is use STD NMR to examine um, small molecules binding to the surface of plastic and understand um, what makes the molecules bind and um, maybe look at the kinetics of leaching from the nanoparticle surface. So we looked at, uh, to begin with, several antibiotics that might also be um, in pollution in waterways um, and be concentrated uh, by these plastic nanoparticles. Um, zooming in on one particular peak of um, amoxicillin and levofloxacin, for example, um, we see that uh, when we 
add the polystyrene beads to the red, uh, the red line, we see that the um, peak for amoxicillin broadens, um, and this indicates binding, um, as indicated by the positive STD effect in the STD spectrum. Um, on the other hand, uh, threonine, which is an amino acid that doesn't bind uh, as a negative control, we don't see any broadening in the 1D proton spectrum, and we also don't see any STD effect. Um, in the case of levofloxacin, for, uh, on the other hand, uh, we see extreme broadening. Um, so when we add the polystyrene beads, we see that the levofloxacin signal uh, becomes a broad hump and really, is really broadened into the baseline. Um, we also don't see any STD effect. Um, and this might be due to low signal to noise. Um, so it's difficult to see, what, to see whether um, perhaps levofloxacin is binding too strongly to the beads, um, so we get this broadening, um, or uh, does the absence of an STD effect indicate that um, it's not binding? So to explore this in more detail, um, we used competition STD. Um, so here we sh show the buildup curve for metronidazole and amoxicillin um, alone. When we combine the two, um, we see that the buildup curve for metronidazole is not uh, really disturbed, whereas that for amoxicillin uh, decreases. So this is in line with um, the relative binding strength that we would expect. Um, since metronidazole alone has a higher STD effect than amoxicillin, um, we can say that metronidazole will bind more strongly. Um, and so we would expect that it would take the binding sites and um, compete for those binding sites and decrease the STD effect uh, for amoxicillin. When we add levofloxacin to both metronidazole or amoxicillin, we see that both of those um, STD buildup curves decrease. Um, and for amoxicillin, um, it decreases more than it does when we add metronidazole. Um, so this is very recent data from our lab. Um, it's very qualitative at this point, but we can say from these results that um, levofloxacin binds more strongly than metronidazole and more strongly than amoxicillin. Um, so we will, uh, for future studies, look at more quantitative um, effects uh, and kind of uh, suss these out. So I think my time is up. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my group, um, and I will certainly take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Leia, for a very interesting presentation. It looks like we have two questions in the q and I'm not sure if you could see that or not, Leia. Um, let me, uh, I don't. If not, I could read them for you. Yes, if you could read them, that'd be great. Sure. The first one is, um, could you comment on the amount of nanoparticle used and if you can reuse your sample? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so the uh, nanoparticles, we purchased them as four weight percent. Um, and uh, we'll dilute them because we have to add it to the, um, the ligand. Um, we, uh, it ends up being about uh, six micromolar in our final samples in terms of uh, nanoparticle concentration. Um, and can we reuse the samples? Um, yes, they're, I mean, they're not damaged by NMR. Um, we haven't looked at trying to uh, sort of separate them and, and get the nanoparticles back out. Um, we haven't looked at that. Uh, yet. Um, but yeah, certainly um, the samples are stable. Um, okay, and then the next question we have, a uh, final question is, why do you see differences in the initial slopes, which is the binding strength, for different aromatic sites? Um, that is a great question. Uh, there are many factors that, um, that affect the SCD curve and the initial slope. Um, yeah, they're um, I guess the molecules are very small, so the difference in um, distance among the aromatic sites is, is small. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have, have a very good answer to that question. Okay, we've got another one real quick, if you can answer. Um, does your method require the nanoparticles to remain in suspension, and have you had problems with nanoparticle aggregation? Right. Um, yes and yes. Uh, yeah, so it, it does require that the nanoparticles stay um, uh, in solution, and um, when things aggregate, then yes, that decreases the concentration of everything. Um, it makes it very hard to kind of quantify these things. Um, okay. Alrighty, well, w in the sake of time, uh, we'd like to thank Leah for her presentation, and we're going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, so we Actually, have... Angela had a quick question, if you want to... Oh, okay. Angela. We have a minute. If if I can have a quick question. Sure. Have you checked the distribution of the size of your beads? Because 
as you know, the largest beads will have the largest effect in your STD, and that may, may have something to do with the difference in the slopes. That, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so these beads, um, according to the manufacturer, they're made to be very uh, monodispersed. Um, and we have actually done some DLS. Um, I don't recall the uh, distribution at the, mo at the moment, but um, yeah, that is a good, but there could, there's definitely some polydispersity. Um, they're not um, absolutely 100% monodispersed. Um, so that is something to, to consider. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dan Conroy uh, from Ohio State University. Um, Dan did his BS at uh, University of Illinois Champaign, where he got introduced into NMR by uh, working in the group of uh, Chad Renstra while he was at the uh, while he was there, uh, and uh, then he moved on to do a PhD at the Ohio State University. And he's a relatively new uh, graduate. He uh, obtained his PhD in 2019 in the area of DMP and solid state NMR of proteins and DNA. Uh, his current position is uh, with uh, the uh, Ohio State University as a N NMR and EPR research associate. He will be presenting today on observing Hoogstein base pairs in DNA using dynamic polarization uh, solid state NMR. And so uh, thank you, Jan, for joining us today. And the uh, floor is all yours. All right, well, well, thank you all for having me. And thank you for joining me for my talk today. Um, as as Dal just mentioned, I'll be talking about hosting based pairs in DNA using um, DMP South Sudan MR. Um, and this is work that I did for my, uh, my PhD with the uh, Chris Joniak's research group here um, at, at Ohio State. Um, so, to, to get into it really quick, I'm just gonna quickly go over what is dynamic nuclear polarization. Um, for those of you who may have attended any conference in the last 10 years or so, you probably have heard a lot about DMP, but um, for, for, for those of you who knew, uh, for those of you who may, maybe knew, I'll, I'll run through exactly what DMP is really quickly. And so DMP is when we um, have a polarization transfer from unpaired electrons um, in a sample in, to, to nearby nuclei, and we achieve this using microwave radiation. And so what this does is it increases our um, the bulk magnetization of the nuclear spins um, in a given sample. And so the reason that this happens is that we um, end up the polarization at any given, temper uh, any given temperature for free electrons is gonna be much higher um, than uh, this is especially biologically relevant, relevant nuclei from protons uh, to carbon 13, nitrogen 15. And this is due to the, the relative dramatic ratios. And so in, um, for, for our samples, the, the main DMP mechanism that we look at is a cross effect mechanism. And so what we're gonna have is gonna be two unpaired electrons that are gonna be um, dipolarly coupled. We, we achieve this by tethering together through an, an organic compound. Um, and then these are gonna be close to, to another nucle nucleus, primarily proton, and then we'll actually achieve that, um, that, that, that DMP through, through this mechanism. So it, when we then move on to DMP cell state NMR spectroscopy, what we do is we, we first will dope our samples with a polarizing agent. And so again, this is typically by radicals, but um, really anything that has a free electron can, can do this effect. Um, for biological samples um, and aqueous samples, we will use a mixture of glycerol, D2, and water. For materials and other type of samples, you'll, you'll want to use a different glass forming solvent. We'll, we'll, then, we'll then pack these samples into these um, uh, sapphire rotors, um, and then and they're going to be frozen down to 100 Kelvin and, and, and spin for, for essentially normal um, MAS and MR experiments. And so you can see that this is the setup that we have here at Ohio State, uh, where we have a 600 megahertz um, NMR, and it's going to be coupled to this gyrotron. The gyrotron is going to uh, generate these um, high power, high frequency microwaves and uh, send them along this, this transmission line. And then the cooling gases that are, are going to get the, temp the sample down to um, 100 Kelvin are, are here, where the, that goes to a liquid nitrogen cabinet that um, we can cool all these gases to. And so the, the, the actual then effect of um, DMP um, NMR is that we get a large signal enhancement. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to show here just a, a spectrum of, of a protein that we have. Um, and this, so this is the signal with the microwave off um, at, at 100 Kelvin. So this is just a, a, a 1D uh, CP experiment. And so when we turn the microwaves on, we get a very large um, DMP enhancement. And so um, you, can, you can then see that this enhancement here is 64. And so um, 
we, we, we can measure that basically by measuring the, the, the micro, the signal with the microwave is on, so the signal with the microwave is off. And um, this, this enhancement in theory is, is just, again, the, the relationship of these dramatic ratios of the electron to the proton, um, which would be on the order of say over 600. Um, but in practice, for, for a number of reasons, mostly due, due to the actual the sample itself and how the um, uh, signal propagates, um, and also just you know paramagnetic effects from bleaching, things like that, the, the actual um, uh, enhancement that, that, that we see is anywhere from 25 to 150. And so what, what, this, what this really means for us and what we care about is the experimental time savings that we can get using DMP. And so um, experiments that could, that could have taken over a day uh, normally can now be done in just a matter of hours. Or experiments that could be taken over a week to a month can be done in, in, in one to just, just a few days. And so uh, this really opens up the opportunity to observe um, uh, less sensitive, uh, less sensitive samples, and, and in particular, looking at minor states. And so, um, for the uh, for for the project that I worked on, I was investigating Hussein-based pairing um, in, in DNA. And so, our goal was to use th this DMP method to observe uh, what is known as Hussein-based pairing, and I'll, I'll go over that. Um, uh, starting with um, some standard samples of, of a DNA and a chelomycin complex, and chelomycin as a drug. And then um, moving on to nucleosome and, and, and chromatin, uh, where we suspect that they may exist. And so, um, again, the, the, the rationale for this is that from these large signal enhancements, um, we, could, we might we have the opportunity using DMP to study a minor state, um, an opportunity that, that is, is not uh, actually that is not available using um, other methods. And so, again, I, I want to acknowledge that this was done in, in collaboration with obviously my, uh, my, my PhD advisor, Chris Stroniak, as well as a fellow student in the group, Nikki Gonzalez. Um, and then also um, Dr. Al Hashimi and um, uh, Henry Yu from uh, from Duke University, um, and and uh, Dr. Hashimi was uh, you know really really lended his um, expertise and uh, and support for the um, the DNA side of it and the sample preparation and, and all of, and actually then and, and a lot of the interpretation of, of what we were seeing um, in our NMR spectra, and so just briefly to go over what is what is hooking base pairing so. Um, in 1953, Watson and Crick proposed the, the um, DNA double helix um, that, that, that we all know and love, the, where we, um, that causes the, um, the, the, the double helix and is actually the, the structure of DNA that, as we know it today. It was actually in 1959 that Karst Hookstein proposed an alternative hydrogen bonding, and there was actually a period of time that it was unknown actually which structure um, was, was, was the dominant one. And so the, the primary difference between the two is that. In Watson Crick, we, we have the, the two hydrogen bonds and then the three hydrogen bonds in, in GNC. Um, well, in, in Hookstein, there's actually um, two in each, and there's actually the, the, this um, uh, uh, cis conformation about, about the um, N, N to C1 prime um, uh, bond that we see. And what actually this what this results in is actually a constriction of, of the helical axis. And so the, 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 this is something that, that we do see in, in samples. It's just, um, again, not, not, not the typical, not the preferred form due to um, energy differences between the two. And so um, Watson Creek is, ener is energetically favorable to hooksin by around three kcals per mole. Um, and so this leads to transient hooksin base pairing um, on the order of 0.4% or 0.01% for GC base pairs. Um, the interesting thing is that these do exist that these transient hooksin um, base pairs exist at lifetimes that are longer than open states. And we already know that open states are very important um, for DNA replication and transcription. And so um, the idea that um, that there, there could be a very biological relevance to hooksin base pairs, but we just don't know it yet. And again, these are most prominent in, in DNA protein and DNA antibiotic AT rich sequences. And so we want to then explore kind of um, where, where these may be showing up in real samples. And so we then want to move on to observing hooksin in nucleosomes. And so we know nucleosomes are very important for our, our, our um, DNA compaction. And so um, uh, um, um, the, the Dr. Hashim's group um, looked at, uh, look, looked at um, published crystal structures of nucleosomes. And then they, they, they want to see, they, they want to observe the actual like DNA assignments um, and, and see, see how much of that um, how much of that crystal structure could be attributed to Watson Crick or, or potentially a, a hooksin base pair? And they found that actually a lot of the, the published crystal structure data was actually ambiguous, primarily because we don't really think about the, the structure of DNA when we're, we're kind of putting these, these structures together. And so um, what, what this means is that there may be some unobserved hooksin base pairs in nucleosomes. 
Um, in particular, that, that there might be actually some specific sites that, that we, we anticipate that there, there could be. And so the, the methods that we want to go about doing this is we want to first assign chemical shifts that correspond to either one structure or the other, either Watson, Crick, or Hoxine uh, geometries. And then we, we want to hope to actually observe interbase, um, either A to T or um, G to C correlations that are going to be unique to one confirmation or the other, essentially that, that would be impossible to see if it was in the, the alternate confirmation. And then finally observe this um, uh, phenomenon in a Curlington sample. And so uh, moving on to our first sample, we, 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 we uh, prepared DNA with uh, the chenomycin complex. And chenomycin is an antibiotic, uh, is, is an anti-tumor antibiotic. And so you can see here, it actually will, will insert itself in, into, into DNA helix and causing the, this torsion, which, which then causes the, this um, AT um, kind of double uh, hoaxing base pairs to form in the middle here. And then so, so we, we then um, uh, preferentially labeled these um, uh, residues with, with carbon-13, nitrogen-15. And then uh, we, uh, we also added the, the amupol bioradical when this is going to be our polarizing agent. And then we, we prepared this all in, in glycerol and water. Um, for, for, the, for the second set of samples that, that we ran, um, we were looking at the nucleosome core particle. And so in the, in the, in the nucleosome, um, the, the, this is, these are a, a lot of work to prepare because they, um, the, there's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a macromolecular complex that, that brings together um, four different um, histone proteins as, as well as DNA. And so what, what we did is we prepared these, these histone proteins um, alongside um, carbon-13, nitrogen, and 15 labeled DNA of this, this WEDOM601 sequence reconstituted it to perform um, into this octamer um, in DNA and to actually then form this nucleosome. Um, and again, there, there's some, some details about the actual um, preparation here. And a lot of this work was done by my colleagues um, in the Droniac group, Nikki Gonzalez, as well as Dr. Prudisam and Dr. Shannon. Um, and so we, we, um, once, once, once we have the nucleosome core particle, we can then pellet it for this DNA, um, for, 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 for this DMP Celsius in MR. And so we, we added a small amount of magnesium that, that actually helps with, with the um, mononucleosome compaction um, uh, to adhere to itself, followed by also centrifugation. And then we were able to see this pellet here. And then we, uh, we then just uh, essentially washed the pellet with, with the amupol glycerol solvent and then we resuspended it and, and, and do a sapphire rotor and, and, uh, and we're ready for our NMR. And so what we, what we first see then when we're looking for, um, when we're looking at these samples is that um, we, we just ran, quickly ran um, 1D um, proton to carbon CP experiments where we see um, the, the enhancement of these samples. And so we actually get enhanced, very large enhancements for the, these DNA samples. And so these are the, the first set of samples where we just have either just pure DNA or DNA with the chenomyosin complex. And so we see enhancements of over 100 to 150. Um, and you can see here that um, the, 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 the bases as well as the sugar residues um, have, have very good signal. Um, and the microwave off spectrum are also shown here, but just note that they're scaled up on a, as a factor of 10 because otherwise it would be, it would be very low into the baseline. So the, the next set of experiments that, that we're going to run and are going to be really key for um, our interpretation here is, is um, T-door T -door experiments. And this is going to be a Z-filter T-door as well as um, a band-selected T-door experiment. And so the the most important thing that we have here is are, are, are these redor sequences. And in these redor sequences, we reintroduce the carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 um, uh, couplings that, that, that we would normally lose through um, solid-state MR spinning. And so um, what this allows us to do is then see, see the correlations between uh, neighboring um, or, or, or nearby through space um, residues. Um, and, and, and the band-selective one here, we, we, we can then add this um, band-selective pulse on, onto carbon-13 to actually then select a particular residence that we want to see in the carbon-13. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight where, where that's important for us. Um, what, what, what we then set up is uh, either we use short mixing times um, and, and based on some of our um, uh, simulations, we, we, we know that a short mixing time of, of less than three milliseconds, we will see relatively short distances. And so this will often be a single bond. Um, once we move on to longer distances, we can then, then th see through space. And it's going to be these longer mixing times that we're going to hope to see the through space across the helical axis um, uh, correlations. And so um, for first for the Watson Crick sample, we want, first want to do the carbon-13, nitrogen-15 chemical shift assignments. And so we're going to use the short mixing time to hopefully see these through bond correlations. And so, so what we see is, is a very um, nice, clean uh, carbon-13, nitrogen-15 correlation spectra. 
where we can actually using these these lines here, we can kind of follow along the the coordination of uh, of, of either the adenine or the thymine base very easily. Um, DNA is, is very nice and convenient for us in that many of the carbons that we have are, are going to be directly bonded to a, a nitrogen. So it makes actually go, walking through this and assigning it very easily. Um, the, well, one of the very key things here is that I'll remind you is that for with 12 hours acquisition time for this 2D, um, this would have taken um, over five and a half days without DMP. And so really um, the, the level of detail that we can see here is, is very powerful using, using DMP. Um, so we're, we're going to re repeat this as well for the genomycin complex to get the Hugstein form. And so what we can do is a similar assignment here. And we, we do see all of the um, carbons and nitrogens um, in, in the uh, bases of the adenine and thymine. Um, when we, we want to do the comparison between the Watson Crick to the Hugstein then of, of these chemical shifts, we do see that, that we do see some chemical shift differences. And that, that, again, that is in part due to this flipping of, the, um, of, of, of this NSC glycosolic bond. Um, so, so there, there, there are some subtle, subtle, subtle changes you can see, and I've drawn here them, them here in black arrows. Um, so, some of the major differences we can see here are, are in, in this region here, where we see the AN3 to the AC4. Um, my mother gets several ppm as well as the AN7 to um, AC8. And while these um, these spectra are broader, um, again due, due to our DMP um, conditions, the our, our lines are typically broader. We still do see some very significant. Um, Chemical shift differences and migrations that we can we can use to um, highlight and, and, and use as a signature for for one base or the other. The um, next thing that we want to move on to is the longer mixing time TDR experiments, and so this is going to be um, anywhere from five milliseconds to, to ten milliseconds, and so this is actually a combination spectra of of, of both of these uh, durations, and so. Um, the, the the thing that we're going to look for is is now the distances that are going to be through space. Going from from one um, one base to the other, and and, and so we, we do we do see a lot of additional correlations here. Um, but what I will highlight is that um, in this um, AN six to to T this AN AN six strip here, um, this is going to be um, while 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 we we see that this is going to be a, to a different base. Um, this here is actually not going to be specific to one one structure or the other. Um, because the um, this distance is going to be shared whether the the bond is, is flipped or not, and so the the, the interesting one uh, piece that we, we see here are this TN three to A AC two. This pops up more as a shoulder, so it's not as uh, as as definitive as as a peak, but it is it, it it is uniquely popping up for us. And then when we do apply the band selective T-door strip, so um, we, we we apply this um, frequency at the frequency of of this TC four, and so what that does for us is that um, we actually get um, more signal out of uh, at, at that frequency because we're gonna um, we're we're, we're gonna re remove the carbon um, carbon um, dipole coupling that, that we would see from the the TC4 to the the TC5 and so what what that allows us to see is, is, is it brings up the, 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 this this important peak for us this AM1 to TC4 and that this AM1 to TC4 is gonna have a very short distance of of 3.7 angstroms. And the alternative uh, distance in, um, in the Hugstein form is over eight angstroms long. And so, so this is really going to be the key peak that we know that if we see this peak, we know it's going to be Watson Crick form because it's going to be really impossible for it to be a, a structure in, in, in the other way. So likewise, we want to then do the same analysis for the Hugstein um, form and see if we can see these also very indicative peaks as well. And so um, the, 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 this TN3 AC8. Um, distance. So this is going to be the, cor the correlation between the, this nitrogen and this carbon. Um, the, the, this one pops up right away, and this is very nice because it is a distinct peak um, in, in the Z filter T door spectrum. And again, when we also apply this band selective um, uh, pulse to the um, TC4, we, we, we also see that the, this um, AN7 to TC4 resonance pop, pop up. And, and these are going to be the really two, two peaks to know that. Um, that these are very indicative of, of a Hugstein form, and again, are, are not going to be um, possible using the the other the other uh, Watson Crick geometry. Um, I also want to highlight that we, we did try some other experiments just to see if there were some differences or if we could see some of these long distance correlations. And so, um, in terms of carbon carbon correlations, we also tried using DAR with, with 500 milliseconds mixing. Um, we do see inner base correlations pop up. Um, uh, all those are highlighted in purple here, but um, essentially all of those can be attributed more to um, distances through DNA stacking. 
rather than ac across the the the, um, the axis of the, the helical axis. So um, while, while these spectra are interesting, and again, we do the same thing with the, the hook scene, while these spectra are interesting, and actually one of the things to note is that the, the hook scene spectra actually does have significantly more correlations than the, um, than, uh, than the watson crick form. So you can see that, that, that it's, it's much emptier. And so part of this is, is because the, the, the hook scene form does, is more constricted. So things in general are closer together. So we do see more correlations. We don't see any one particular peak that we can pull out and point together um, to, to say that this is one form or the other, we can just kind of more use it as, as a qualitative um, observation that, that, that the Hoogstein form does seem where everything is, is closer together. Um, then moving on to the nucleosome core particle, um, we, we, we see a similar enhancement of over 122. So yeah, we, we know that we're, we're getting very good enhancement. Uh, we can do that, that, that short uh, Z filter two or mixing to kind of do the assignments. And so this is going to be more crowded. Uh, this is going to be much more crowded of a spectrum because we have um, not, not G's and C's as well, um, aside from just having a single um, A and T label. But you, you, even with the additional crowding, we are, are able to kind of go through and assign um, each, each of the each of the bases uh, individually. And then, and then we're, we're going we're to re repeat some of the experiments um, that we did before. So we're going to use the this band selected T door as well as the Z filter T door to kind to kind of see if, if we can highlight some of the um, to, to see if, if we can observe any hook scene populations in, in, the, in, this, in this first sample that we prepare. And so, so to kind of zoom in on, on, on the analysis here, um, in, the, in the short mixing time T-door, again, we want, want to look for more just the chemical shift differences um, from, from one form to the other. And so um, in uh, the, the, the blue highlighted here is going to be the hook scene form, and, and the red um, circles are going to be the Watson Crick form. And so um, ultimately what we can see is that um, that, that, that is especially due to the broadening of just having a uniformly labeled sample, um, it, it's, it's hard to really distinguish whether or not um, there are any new populations of hook scene. And in fact, it's, it's likely that there isn't. Um, we, we hoped in future samples that maybe cutting down on the amount of uh, sample that's actually um, labeled that, that we could potentially see some of these chemical shift differences, especially in these areas of the, of the, of the spectrum where, the, where they really are wide open. So if a hook scene um, peak is there, it should pop up you know, uniquely. In the, Z filter T door and the band selected T door again. We can also highlight um, some of these structures, and so um, ultimately, with this analysis, is that we we don't see um, any any hooksine population in this particular sample. Um, predicting um, our hooksine population from the nucleosome core particle of, of the um, of the of crystal structures, we anticipate anywhere from one to ten percent possibly, um, and, we, and, we, and we don't observe uh, don't observe that hooksine population in this particular sample. Um, and so I'll, again, I'll, rem I'll remind that this is the the the, the Weedum 601 sequence is just one, one of the, the DNA sequences that, that we could look at. And so in, in ter terms of what our goals were and what we actually accomplished, we were able to assign um, all, all these chemical shifts that correspond to one structure or the other. We were able to observe unique correlations that correspond to either the Hoogstein form or the Watson Crick form, and that these can be used as, as very signature markers for, for one structure or the other. Um, but we were not able to observe the, the hooksine phenomena in, in chronochromatin sample. And so um, really the, the, the next stage of the, of, the progress of the project that's going on right now is using more targeted sequences that, that um, we anticipate have um, higher hooksine probabilities, um, as well as um, more selectively labeling uh, specific sites um, along those DNA that are going to have the, those probable hooksine base pairs. And so what, we, what this first sample we prepared was, was uniformly labeled. So we saw all the A, T, G, and Cs. And G and Cs, while they, they can form hook scenes, the probability is much less. Um, by more uh, labeling selectively um, on, on, on these structures, we hope that we can, um, and in future samples, actually observe these hook scene based pairs directly in, in a chromatin sample. OK, and, and so with that, I just want to um, thank uh, my, my colleagues at, at Ohio State University, particularly Don, uh, Dr. Chris Jornick, my advisor, um, as well as fellow group members of the, um, of, of, of the group, um, Brooker Biospin for their help, especially with a lot of the, this DMP work, um, and then Duke University, who really um, kind of helped us a lot with, with this hosting project and, and really um, showed us a lot what we can do uh, with, with the DNA. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop now and take some questions. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for this very interesting presentation. I mean, to me, it's amazing what you can do when you hook a gyotron up to an NMR and some of these line shapes. I mean, the days of looking at solid state NMR is just a bunch of blobs is long over. I mean, it's amazing the kind of resolution you could get from these two-dimensional spectra. Yeah. Um, 
we do have a question, the question in a box, but I would uh, say to anybody who uh, happens to be a panelist and wants to ask a question, if you could just please unmute yourself and feel free to ask away. Uh, so we do have a question, the question in a box. And I'm not sure if you could see it, Dan, I could read it for you if you need me to. Yeah, it's already, I'm not sure where it went. Okay, uh, is there a strong possibility that the polariza polarizing agent itself will bias the nucleotides to one form of base pairing over another? So th there, I, I, I would say it's, th there, there's, there's always a possibility, but it's unlikely. So we, we, we did prepare, um, we, we did kind of run, run through um, several samples um, with and without um, well, with and without the, the, the radical, obviously the samples without the radical, we don't see much polarization. So it takes them a lot longer to, to kind of go through and, and make sure that we can see them. And so primarily we did that um, with the DNA sample with, with and without radical. And so we, we did not see any, any change in the, in the Watson Crick structure of the, um, of, 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 of DNA when, when we basically introduced a radical. Now for the actual nucleosome and uh, the achenomycin complexes, uh, we, we, we didn't, we didn't do, do that test, but we also know that achenomycin binds DNA very strongly and very selectively, and as well as the, these nucleosome core particles are also very, um, very stable, very, very, very rigid. And so we, we don't anticipate that, that, the, that the radical itself is going um, is, 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 is to disrupt it. And in fact, amipol is, is, is rather bulky, and, it, and it's, it's, it's unlikely that's going to um, really going to have too, many, too much affinity or kind of be, be able to insert itself. Um, in, in, into a DNA sequence in any form. Um, and if it, if it were to interact somehow, it's unlikely that would actually kind of cause this hugsine base pairing. So I, I don't anticipate that that's, that's gonna be an issue. And, and really from the, the samples that, 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 we went, that we ran through, we really didn't see any, diff, any, any major effect from, from the um, radical itself. Okay. Um, Marcus, I think you have a question. Yes, Dan, uh, beautiful uh, talk and uh, spectra. I was wondering, not having done uh, ever DNP, what are the special challenges you're dealing with hooking up a gyroton to the uh, to the NMR and then uh, doing the experiments? Yeah, so so the um, I, 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 obviously there's the infiltration aspect in terms that you actually have to have the in instrument available, um, and there, there there are more. Um, there, there are more challenges actually than, than running the experiments, and so part of it is, is keeping these experiments uh, low and low, at low temperature and, and running continuously for potential days on end, especially with some of these longer Tito experiments. We, we, we ran them for about five days apiece. And so, um, so, so, so there are just physical challenges in making sure that you can have, you have the net, net liquid nitrogen available and at regular interchanges and, and all that stuff to make sure that these samples stay at low temperature and, and stay stable. But then also the, one of the more um, real practicalities is, is comes to actually when sam with sample preparation and that a lot of samples are very different and kind of need to be prepared differently. And so one, uh, so, so kind of like the, the, the routine go-to um, sample prep is, 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 is DMP juice where you use glycerol and, um, and D2 on water um, in, in, in a very specific ratio with, with, with a certain amount of biradical and you just kind of throw it all together and, and you do your DMP. And while that works is that it, while it works, it's rarely ever optimal for any given sample. And so um, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the work is kind of done on the front end in terms of really trying to optimize your sample prep for what you want to see. And so again, that, that differs a lot from, um, for, for, for us, the, the DNA samples are relatively smaller, but then when we move to like some of our protein um, samples that, 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 that prep changed quite a bit. And then if you want to look at, um, you know, whether you want to go into materials or anything, other things like that, um, the, the, the prep also changes. And so the, the real practicality difference is, is going to be on the front end in terms of how to make the sample to, to, to best use DMP. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, we can move along to our next speaker, the final speaker of this first session of the morning. Uh, the speaker will be uh, Professor David Wilkie from uh, Michigan State University. Uh, Professor Wilkie uh, obtained a bachelor's degree uh, in chemistry and physics from Swarthmore College. He did his PhD at the University of Chicago. And where I first became familiar with his work when he was a uh, postdoc in Rob Tico's group at NIH. And I do believe he might have been working on amyloid fibrils then, but 
I could be wrong, but that's when I first um, uh, got familiar with Dave's work. He then moved on to an independent career at uh, Michigan State University in the Department of Chemistry, uh, where he is now full professor. Uh, today, Dave will be talking about uh, 2D, excuse me, deuterium NMR evidence for lipid acyl chain disordering with viral fusion peptides. So if uh, Dave is ready to go, I'll just turn it over to him and thank you uh, for your attention. Yes, uh, so everybody can hear me? Yes. Good, great. Yeah, thanks very much for the, oh, I can, can, uh, Uh, oh, anyway, yes. Great, so thanks very much for the opportunity to speak at this really interesting conference. Uh, so this is uh, obviously a, an older picture of my group back when we were not socially distanced. Uh, this is uh, much of this work was done by Ujjaini Ghosh. So my group has been interested for several years in understanding an important feature of enveloped virus infection of cells. So enveloped viruses are viruses that have a membrane. They pick up that membrane when they leave an infected host cell. Uh, Examples are HIV, influenza, and also the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're particularly interested in the uh, initial joining step of the membrane of the virus and the membrane of the cell. And that's shown here on the right in electron micrographs of actually different virions at different steps of this joining or it's termed membrane fusion process. So on the left is uh, artistic interpretation of the electron micrographs. You can see that you start with distinct viral and cell membranes, they come together and then form a uh, contiguous membrane composed of the cell membrane and what was the viral membrane. The important feature is that the viral genetic material, in the case of HIV, it's RNA, is in the cytoplasm after fusion, and then there's the possibility of viral replication. So membrane bilayers are very stable in aqueous medium, and under most circumstances, they will not fuse with each other. That's because of very high activation barriers between different steps in the process. So each virus family has evolved a catalytic protein in its membrane that's called a fusion protein. And in the case of HIV, it's a glycoprotein 160 kilodalton complex. So the function of this protein is to reduce these activation barriers and to increase the fusion rate. So these enveloped viruses typically have an alternate infection route. This is again shown for HIV, um, in which the virus is first endocytosed, and the fusion event then is between the uh, viral membrane and the endosomal membrane. But the end result is that the viral RNA then is um, ends up in the host cell cytoplasm and there's the possibility of viral replication. So I think it's important for this problem to think about and understand the barriers for the uncatalyzed process. So this process typically doesn't happen with any appreciable rate experimentally. So um, the main route to understand the barriers is through computation. And this figure is from this review paper. Um, so what's shown on top is a plausible fusion model with intermediate topological states of the membrane. 
on the bottom is the computed barriers. I think one important result is that the largest barrier is actually before any membrane fusion at all is just bringing two membranes close together. That's 25 kcals per mole. Um, the reason for this very high barrier is the removal of water um, and the increase in the repulsive electrostatic interactions of the lipid head groups. There are barriers between the intermediate states of the membrane after the apposition. Uh, those are lower, about 10 kcals per mole. So the uh, fusion for the viruses, again, is catalyzed by the fusion protein. It's a single pass uh, protein of the virus membrane. Very interestingly, there's a very little sequence homology between the fusion proteins from different virus families. So here's this is a case of independent evolution. There is some structural homology uh, that I will talk about in just a bit. So these proteins do, though, all have a large region outside the virus that's called the ectodomain, and that is the catalytic part of the protein. So this is a model for the protein catalyzed fusion uh, from our group, uh, based on experimental data from our group, and as well as uh, data from other groups. So one common feature of all fusion models is that there's uh, some region in the N-terminal part of the protein that is thought to bind to the target membrane. Uh, this region is called the fusion peptide, and it's typically about 25 residues. Another common feature is that all of these proteins form a final state that is a hairpin. And kind of what we propose in our model is that kind of through the uh, attachment to the viral membrane, through the transmembrane domain, and the fusion peptide through the target membrane, this final state is the catalytic state. And it serves to compensate for this very large apposition barrier. I would say in the distinctive part in our model is that the, the hairpin state is a catalytic state. Sort of many other models call the hairpin state a, a post-fusion state and sort of not important for catalysis. Um, so one sort of, again, common feature of all fusion proteins is the very high stability of this final hairpin state. And So uh, we did some experiments to test for whether this stability is important. Um, this uh, was done by producing actually full-length uh, hemagglutinin or influenza HA2 fusion protein with the transmembrane domain, um, as well as two point mutants. Uh, uh, I-173E in the hairpin, and G1E, which is actually not in the hairpin, it's at the end terminus of the fusion peptide. Uh, we picked these mutants because they were known to disrupt fusion, and that's what we also observe. And then we did uh, circular dichroism spectroscopy as a function of temperature to monitor the stability of the wild type as well as the mutant protein. So these are spectra for the G1E mutant, in particular, this 222 nanometer signal as a function of temperature is a marker for the protein stability. And the important point is that the wild type protein, for example, here in blue, is uh, much more stable than the mutants uh, here in uh, orange and red. So there's actually a 30 to 40 degree reduction in the melting temperature of the protein with both mutants. I, I think the fusion peptide mutant was really surprising. It was surprising to us that that would disrupt the overall hairpin stability of the protein, but it, it does. So uh, kind of I 
pre presented um, some evidence for the importance of the hairpin structure in the uh, hairpin stability for membrane fusion. And we propose again that this is important for uh, catalyzing the apposition step. In the rest of my talk, I'm going to discuss how the fusion proteins might uh, reduce the activation barriers for uh, the smaller um, the smaller barriers between the the subsequent uh, fusion intermediates. And for many years, it's been proposed that the fusion peptide, which binds the target membrane, changes the target membrane in some way that um, reduces these barriers and increases the fusion rate. I want to talk a little bit about fusion peptides. So like the rest of the fusion protein sequence, um, there isn't sequ sequence homology between fusion peptides of different virus families. In addition, um, a single fusion peptide can adopt multiple structures in membrane. I want to focus on the structures of the peptides in the membrane samples uh, that I'm going to talk about in a bit. So, um, so in a series, in a, in a uh, Jack's paper in 2015, um, we show Uh, these two in membrane, um, they're you know little helical hairpins, and I just emphasize this hairpin is different than the much larger hairpin that I was talking about earlier, and we were um, helped very much by uh, a series of very um, nice structural and dynamics papers of the peptide in detergent-rich media by Justin Lorio and Ad Bax. So in our samples, the HIV peptide has a very different structure. Um, it's an intermolecular anti-parallel beta sheet structure that we elucidated by NMR in uh, several papers, a subset of which is shown here. So you have very different structures in our samples for the flu peptide and the HIV peptide. So then we've gone on to do NMR of the lipid molecules of the membrane in the absence and the presence of peptide to understand sort of how the membrane is changed. So what I'm showing here are phosphorus NMR spectra of lipid dispersions. And the sort of bottom line result is that the, the spectra don't change with addition of peptide and the powder pattern is consistent with retention of the bilayer phase. Uh, this is even more striking in the powder spectra of deuterated lipids with and without fusion peptide. So the uh, lipid chains are perdeuterated. So we're looking at a sum of the powder patterns from the different deuterons. But you can see qualitatively and semi-quantitatively that even a 10 mole percent fusion peptide uh, the bilayer phase is retained. And this is just a, a positive control. We added the B venom peptide melatonin. You can see that the deuterium powder pattern changes dramatically. There's a large isotropic peak that is consistent with uh, destruction of the membrane bilayer. So at first, this result was surprising to me. Um, just because I, I thought there might be a larger change. But in thinking about it, the function of these fusion proteins is to catalyze fusion. It's not to do wholesale destruction, for example, of the plasma membrane, which would be very deleterious to the cell, probably kill the cell, and therefore there couldn't be viral replication. So the effects of the fusion peptide, um, if they're there, have to be more subtle. Um, this has been. Uh, examined by uh, different experimental techniques, uh, different ideas, uh, uh, different experimental groups. This is an incomplete subset of some of the possible effects of the fusion peptide in some of the groups who worked on it. 
Um, I want to focus, though, on a different effect that was first proposed based on molecular dynamic simulations of the influenza, influenza fusion peptide monomer, first by Peter Kassen, and then the effects were also observed by other simulation groups. The basic idea is that the, the uh, lipid acyl chains experience much larger excursions from the membrane with the peptide than without. So these excursions are called lipid acyl chain protrusion. There's an, an accompanying lipid head group intrusion. Um, the reason this would uh, catalyze, uh, in particular, this um, uh, red step infusion is that uh, this step is going from two leaflets to one leaflet. So in order to have that happen, the acyl, chain, um, acyl chains from the different leaflets have to move towards each other, sort of into the aqueous environment. So um, already having protrusion with the fusion peptide would uh, reduce the barrier for this protrusion and increase the red step fusion rate. So as expected, because of the larger excursions, all of the simulations show that the acyl chains have smaller order parameters with the fusion peptide. Uh, this is not consistent with uh, EPR work from Jack Fried's group um, with, on samples with fusion peptide and a small fraction of spin-labeled lipid. So these are really um, measurements on the spin-label, and they were interpreted to show larger order parameters of the acyl chain with fusion peptide. So what we did was um, to look at all of the lipid acyl chains using deuterium NMR of membranes with perdeuterated uh, acyl chains. So um, these are the DPAKE spectra. Um, they're really the superposition of spectra from um, all of the deuterons, but there's a well-known monotonic decrease in the spectral splittings and order parameters as you move from the head group to the terminus of the chain. So you can see you know, visually from the spectra that addition of either the monomer helical flu peptide or the intermolecular beta sheet HIV peptide leads to an overall reduction in the spectral splittings and a reduction in the order parameters. We examined this quantitatively by uh, the uh, known linear relationship between the spectral splitting um, and the order parameter. And what I'm plotting here are the fractional changes in the order parameter for the flu peptide and the HIV fusion peptide as a function of carbon number. So kind of consistent with the spectra, we see reductions for both peptides. There's additional conclusions. Um, you can see in the spectra and then in the analysis that there are larger reductions for the beta sheet peptide. Also for both peptides in both structures, the reductions are larger for the uh, parts of the acyl chain closer to the lipid tail than the head group. Uh, this is consistent with deep fusion peptide insertion in the membrane, which uh, we've also observed uh, by NMR measurements of peptide to specific lipid site contacts. There's semi-quantitative agreement between our changes in order parameters and what's observed in the MD simulations. Obviously, there's disagreement with the EPR results. Um, my hypothesis is that in the EPR, they may be observing a, an, uh, an ordering that's specific to the spin label um, rather than to all of the acyl chains. Of course, in, in our experiments, we are detecting uh, the total population of acyl chains of the lipids of the membrane. So the disordering is also apparent in the 
uh, temperature dependence of the deuterium powder patterns. I show powder patterns here at four different temperatures. And in any sample, if you reduce the temperature, you will increase ordering, and that will lead to broadening of the spectra. I want to highlight, though, that the, the spectra <clears throat> with peptide um, at zero degrees C look sort of most similar to the 20 degree spectra without peptide. And this um, really large difference in temperature for, uh, for, for having fusion peptide in the sample, um, it appears to be a common feature for both the um, helical monomeric flu peptide and the intermolecular beta sheet HIV peptide. So the other experiments that we've done is to measure the deuterium transverse relaxation rates. So what I'm showing here is a series of spectra with increasing relaxation time for different samples. Uh, we used a different time increment in the different samples, but the horizontal axis is a uh, common time axis for all the samples. And it's clear visually that the re relaxation rate is substantially higher for the samples with fusion peptide than without. And we're doing the more complete quantitative analysis now but these uh, much higher relaxation rates with fusion peptide would be consistent with larger amplitude acyl chain motions um, due to the presence of the peptide. Again, at least consistent with the lipid protrusion that's observed in the molecular dynamic simulations. So to summarize, uh, I've presented evidence that the Membrane apposition barrier is compensated for by this fusion protein hairpin stability. There's disordering of the lipid acyl chains with either helical or beta sheet structures of fusion peptides. And the fusion peptides also induce, induce large increases in the um, acyl chain deuterium transverse relaxation rates, which is consistent with the large uh, much larger amplitudes of acyl chain motions with the fusion peptide that will be helpful in reducing the barrier for going from two leaflets to one leaflet. So uh, thanks very much, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Well, thank you very much for that uh, stimulating presentation, Dave. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Uh, it's really uh, a very nice example. I think sometimes people often overlook the power behind uh, deuterium solid state NMR in terms of being able to look at dynamics and, and, uh, and things of like by looking at the line shape. It's really a, a very nice example where you can clearly see uh, differences in the uh, pate pattern uh, depending upon the orientation of samples. Uh, so are these samples, uh, the progenerate ones, are they difficult to make, Dave? Are they done in your lab or is it something that you could have made for you? Yeah. Uh, we. We purchase the perdeuterated lipids. We uh, typically have made the fusion peptides ourselves. They, you know, often that's because we want uh, carbon and nitrogen and sometimes deuterium labeling of the uh, peptides. Um, you, we have tried to get um, and have had some success in, in getting, you know, all the peptide companies to make those for us. It's, um, you know, it, it, it seems like it, it, it can work. It's, it's harder to get labeled samples that way. Uh, for, you know, for these, the, the spectra I, I talked about, the, the peptides didn't have to be labeled. Um, I would say the other, you know, important point always in making the samples is sort of how you incorporate the protein into the membrane. And I mean, there's sort of, well, there's a variety of, of approaches and uh, kind of 
we typically are, try to do is to use um, kind of for the same you know kind of sample we will make do the incorporation by um, at least two different approaches and um, see that we see the same result. And then it's particularly important if you're looking at the effects of the peptide on the lipid molecules. Okay. We do have a question, Dave. I'm not sure if you could see the Q&A panel. I can't, no. Okay, I could read it for you. Um, you were complimented on your talk, first of all. This is from, uh, from Gary Lorigan. He's asking, uh, do the peptides alter the phase transition temperature of the lipids? And also, are the peptide lipid ratios the same in the EPR studies? Yeah, these are both really good questions. Um, so uh, I think, you know, what these peptides do, like most peptides, is um, really to eliminate the clear, um, at least by calorimetry, phase transition, the fluid to gel phase transition of the lipids. Um, again, this is, these are, uh, was a single lipid uh, DMPC, which in the absence of peptide would have a, a very sharp first order phase transition uh, at 19 degrees C for the perdurated lipid. Um, and yes, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think the EPR conditions are different. Um, the ratios are lower and it's, it's kind of an interesting, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into the details. So, so the spin labeled lipid is at a one is 0.5 mole percent. So that's one out of every 200 lipids is spin labeled. The ordering effect that's observed in the EPR experiments starts at, or it's even, it's about halfway there at one to 1,000 peptide to lipid ratio. And it, um, it flattens out at one to 200. So the EPR experiments, all the effects are at, at um, much lower peptide to lipid ratios than what we're using, which is typically one to 25, one to 50. Um, and I think the, you know, the fact that the onset of the effect they see is at one to 1,000 and that it completely levels off at one to 200, it is at least consistent with the, the possibility of a specific uh, peptide to spin label interaction because the, the, the effect levels off when the amount of peptide in the membrane is equal to the amount of spin labeled lipid. Okay, very good. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A and I do not see any questions in the chat. So uh, I would just like to thank our three presenters this morning and uh, for, their, uh, for their time. And I believe that this meeting got off to a very good start. It's, it's great to see that uh, NMR is uh, alive and well in, in the Gateway area. And so we appreciate their time that we're gonna take a brief uh, 15 minute break to allow everybody to kind of stretch their legs a little bit, maybe get something to drink or eat. And we will be back with our keynote presentation, which will be uh, um, Dr. Um, Richard Kowaki from uh, St. Jude's uh, um, um, Center, and he will be giving a talk. And so uh, we will see you at 10:15 uh, 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 Central Time, 11:15 Eastern Time. So thank you very much for this morning. Thank you for your attendance.